Workshop Watch. Werkstattschau. Hier im Museum bauen wir Flugzeuge, restaurieren Autos und Motorräder, feilen, schweißen, hämmern, klopfen, wundern uns, schweißen und hobeln weiter. Und wo gehobelt wird, so sagt man, fallen Späne. Und die sollt ihr hier sehen können. Welcome, dear friends, to a new episode of our Workshop Watch. How to build an airplane. Part 6. Building of the Engels E7 or a reproduction of the Fokker V40. Well, part six of our documentation about the construction of the Engels E7, that is the Fokker V40, one might say the first German microlight aircraft. But we talked about that before. In the last episode, we started with the first drawings for the wing. Without these drawings, actually building the wing is quite difficult. Apart from that, our intention is to create a complete set of engineering drawings for that aircraft. The previous drawing was the general arrangement drawing for the wing assembly. This we used to determine how many single parts actually go into one of the wings and which drawings will be needed for which of the single parts. It isn't really important, but maybe of interest to hear. The entire wing consists of about 4,900 and 74 single pieces. However, this includes 4,200 little pins and nails, which actually leaves us with, with uh, 774 single pieces that go into the wing. It's not really important, but <laughs> maybe of interest to hear. The airfoil of the Fokker V40, it is actually based on the lower wing airfoil of the Fokker D7. At least there is strong evidence that leads to the assumption that this was the case. While creating the drawings we also need a trajectory plan that determines the wing rib airfoil sections in between the very center rib and the outermost rib. This is required because uh, the airfoil tapers towards the tip of the wing. This has to do with the aerodynamic thoughts that went into the wing. Fokker was way ahead of its time when he did those wings and I want to explain this to you in detail here. We know, or at least we are very confident, that the airfoil section of the Fokker V40 was based on the lower wing profile of the Fokker D7, if not the original profile of the Fokker D7 was actually taken to develop this wing's aircraft, this aircraft's wings. The V40, however, has different wing spars. This means that the way the wing or the airfoil tapers in respect to its height toward the wing tip is different than it is in the Fokker D7. And this in turn determines the shape of the ribs on their way towards the tip. To generate the required trajectory plan, we need to know the airfoil of the innermost rib, which is the Fokker D7's lower wing inner center located wing rib. And we need to have the outermost wing rib, the smallest rib at the wing tip. And this outermost smallest rib, uh, in principle, is laid out according to all the features that have to go into the wing. One of these features is the attachment of the aileron and of course the brackets that hold the pulleys for the control cables to activate the ailerons. I need a certain height in the position of the wing spar to be able to attach them to it. So these are the certain points that uh, require to be considered when laying out the shape of the outermost wing rib. The wings center the inner area which is not tapering is made from Fokker D7 lower wing ribs. 
This tapering causes the curvature of the wing ribs in the outer area of the airfoil to be stretched. This is because the wing remains the same depth over the entire span. There is therefore no taper in the plane view. We only have a taper in the height of the profile towards the outside. As a result, just as with the D7, the bottom contour of the rib remains identical to the outside. And now something special happening. By stretching the profile at the top, the curvature is reduced towards the outside. However, reducing the camber towards the outside means that at the same airspeed I have a stall first in the inner area of the wing, while the ailerons in the outer area remain fully in the airflow and effective until the final stall happens. Pretty smart. Now I have designed a profile based on the base height that is required, freehand so to speak. I have constructed a profile based on the height of the base which is necessary, just as I thought it could fit in and how it corresponds with the historical photos. And then I noticed something. After I had designed the profile, I took the outermost ring rib of the Fokker D8, which is the Engels E6, for fun and placed it on the profile for comparison. And then I realized that the airfoil is higher than that of the D8, but if I lay it on exactly, I have exactly the same upper side of the airfoil in the D8 as in the V40. Only the overall height differs by about 2 cm, because the aileron pulley fittings still has to fit in. On the D8 it sits further inward, while the pulley fits in this place. But now, the outer profile corresponds to the Fokker D7, the inner profile to the D8. This is no coincidence, it is intentional. And another fact adds up to it. When I put the outer wing rib of the D8 exactly on top of the bottom line of the V40 airfoil, at that time the reference line for a profile was the tangenting bottom line of the profile, not the center as we do today. If I put the bottom lines on top of each other, then the top of the airfoil does not match. But when the rear of the D8 airfoil is raised by 1.5 degrees, then I have the same set on the upper side as on the wing of the D8. This is also negatively offset by 1.5 degrees to the outside. This again in my opinion is not coincidence. What we do here is exactly what Fokker did during the design of the wing of the Fokker V40, as far as we can tell today. So much about the design of the airfoil used with the Fokker V40. Again, this is the conclusion I come up with. I need a trajectory to construct the intermediate ribs. This is not a construction drawing. This plan is only a constructive way of defining a shape that lies between two given shapes if they are to be aligned. As the underside of the profile is identical for all ribs, I don't need to draw this as often as I have ribs in the wing. That would be daft. So I go to the drawing and use a trick. I place all the ribs with the underside on top of each other and only draw the respective upper line. It does not matter for this drawing whether the rib is located down here or in its actual position. This is why my drawing of the spar looks as if it is sloping downwards from the top. In fact it does not. You can see it down here in the condensed drawing of the spar. As you can see it tapers uniformly from top and bottom in the front view. And in the top view you can see it from the front and to the rear equally towards the tip. Condensed drawings as seen here for the wing spar. 
are used if your space on the sheet of paper is limited, condensed in this case uh, with respect to length. This means I have the width of the spar and the height of the spar drawn in full size, while the length is condensed in a scale of 1 to 10. This way all measurements can be taken directly from the drawing. And that way I can combine all the information on one single sheet. And since all those arrows on a drawing would be confusing, we decided to put all the measurements in tabular form underneath. Those who can read such a trajectory plan actually have all the information required to build the wing. Based on this trajectory, every rib can now get its own rib drawing developed from this. The rib drawings then in turn provide all the information required to build the templates which are then used to actually build the ribs. And this is what we will see today in this episode of our Workshop Watch. I sincerely hope you enjoy this. I still have a tiresome business ahead of me. I always draw everything in pencil first and then draw it out in ink. But then I still have my annoying pencil marks there. That gets in the way when copying later. Now it works for viewing, because the ink is much darker. But when copying, the pencil strokes also come out dark and that makes it confusing. And so all the rubbish under the ink is erased. And that's still to be done. That's one more hour. And for those who are interested in drawings and their creation, you need an eraser that only removes the pencil strokes. There are also erasers that go onto the ink, or smear, or rub. You can find all sorts here. A good, soft eraser that only removes the pencil structure is best in this case. Yes, can't think of much else yet. Now let's move on. All that said, the trajectory plan is used to create single drawings for each rib, which in turn can be used to create the templates to build the ribs and all the other parts, including the spars, etc, etc. And for those interested, our drawings are available on request. The building templates are multifunctional tools. They are used to cut out the rib webs from plywood, true to shape, and to assemble the individual parts of the rib. The plywood ribs are therefore first marked out plywood panel and roughly sawn out with oversize on the bandsaw. Everything that protrudes is then milled off along the milling template using the flush milling cutter. The openings for the internal cross bracing of the wing are drilled with a Forstner bit. We have already documented the construction of the ribs in a separate video. I will link this again in the video description. The plywood cross pieces of the V40 are made of 1 mm thick plywood, which in turn is made of three layers of veneer. These three layers of veneer would tear out if you simply drill through them. Therefore, only cuts are made on each side until the part falls out. Initially, only test ribs were built for both aircraft. These test ribs are then used for load tests. The test strips serve to prove that the resin we used, in this case a product from West Systems, is more suitable for the intended location than the aerodux otherwise specified by the Federal Aviation Office. The proof is also important to ensure that the ribs can be considered safe in their original design. And in January, Steffen slowly started to build ribs. I demonstrated everything to him and he imitated me and built his first practice ribs. 
First, the planks are roughly cut out and then milled along the template using the flush milling cutter. Now, Stefan, how do you like the method of rip routing this way? Simple and effective, isn't it? The templates work well, and if you treat them with care, they will last a while. I really have to be careful with the tip at the back. Yeah, be careful. Otherwise, you have to make me a new template. This one is now mm, about 15 years old. I don't want to be the one who breaks it. And here we have the finished routed grip webs. They can be taken out of the form now and be slightly sanded. Done with the first step. Don't push through with force, just so that the top layer is cut. Shaky machines here at the angles. Everything is falling apart. We need five hands to operate it. Good heavens! It's like the Dark Ages. Only electric. Yes, that's true. So when it comes down, you have to get used to it. Don't break it out. If it isn't through yet, continue cutting. It makes you feel like the first man. You made it look easier. Character tools. It's all a matter of getting used to it. Ah, see, did you feel it? Now you have a nice and clean cut hole with no frayed edges for your cross bracing. Looks good. The others too. Genau. Next step is to laminate the nose pieces from veneer strips. 
And the Kübelmaster uh, is the guy with the beer in the background. He's got nothing better to do than to drink a beer and to watch others work. One creates, one photographs <laughs> and the other watches and drinks beer. At 10 o'clock in the morning in Germany. Remember, back then, the Kübelmaster. Just like an apprenticeship. The laminated nose pieces are cut cleanly on a circular saw to the width of the rib cap strips. Incidentally, this is also one of the numerous Fokker construction methods that became established in the post-war years in the emerging glider construction and then also in motorized aircraft. Beer also belongs to it. That's the way beer is also an important part of it, and if there's no beer, then there's coffee. All the nose pieces have to be deburred, of course. One buddy works, and two are just watching. Just like in real life. Am I messing around with this for too long? Well, you have to remember the aircraft only has 18 ribs, so it doesn't matter very much. But in serial production, of course, they would not have made such a fuss of it. They would just scratch the, the phrase off and that's it. The rib cap strips and the nose pieces are scarf joined. And this also Stefan has to practice. And this is the Fokker typical wrapping, to which the covering is later sewn in the finished wing. This is the way it was done back then. And this wrapping is the reason why we can't use the Aerodux uh, glue. But we will talk about that later. Oh boy, again and again. Steffen's first self-built rib. So one bent nail after the other. Good heavens. Those of you followers out there who are interested in our little museum and the work we do will also have noticed that we have been having problems with our roof over the workshop for some time now. This winter it escalated. The brittle roof tiles soaked up water and one night, when it was just under minus 20 degrees Celsius, the whole thing started to blow up and many of the roof tiles burst. I couldn't keep up with replacing buckets for a few weeks. Thanks to the active help and donations from friends of the museum in procuring new roof tiles, we have now at least been able to replace the old ones. Without your donations this would not have been feasible for the museum and we would have had to stop our work. With our own labor and the manual help of friends and family, the old roof tiles were removed and new ones installed within 19 days. Now the workshop rooms in the first hall are rainproof again and we can also do some decorating inside. This kind of work is necessary to maintain the buildings, which is why we continue to welcome donations for the museum. No, don't do it now. That's better. During his lunch break, Franz Josef often comes to see what is being done. Ah, the workbench has also been greased. I need to repair it real fast, Achim. Did you damage it? Nope. Did the handle fall out? What well, happens? But that's nice. 
So what are you doing right now? That one? That one and that one. Now when they are dry, one will be wrapped and the other drilled and then it goes on. Yes. What is now? Uh, what is now with the with the fabric? That's not a problem anymore. Using Aerodux, it would be critical since it does not penetrate the fabric wrapping. One does not penetrate and the other does. But we do the required test runs for approval and then we are good. Well, the Aerodux is strong as heck, but here it creates rather a break point at the fabric edge. Hüste, <laughs> hüste. The boss says it's good. Or did I get it wrong? I no, perfect, all good. And once the individual approval relevant matters have been discussed with the construction inspectors and the expert from the Federal Aviation Office, serious production of the ribs can begin. Stefan has taken three days to do this, which he spends with me, so he builds the ribs for his aeroplane under my supervision and I help him. If you are a well rehearsed team, then it runs smoothly and goes like making cats. Here the nails are inserted into the unwrapped whip cap strips, so that they only need to be hammered in afterwards. Further laminated nose rib pieces are cut open. The design and choice of materials for these laminated nose pieces at Fokker is also an interesting topic of its own. These also underwent a certain evolution. At the beginning of series production of the Fokker D7, for example, there were continuous solid wood moldings. These were later replaced by plywood nose panels. This was easier and faster in large scale production. Later, during the development of the Fokker E5, and D8 respectively. The switch was made to laminate nose pieces as we are doing it for the V40 as it falls into this period of evolution. And the fact that no nose filler blocks were used uh, in the V40 can be clearly seen in the factory photos of the aircraft under construction. Preparing the scarf joints to link the nose pieces with the rest of the cap strips. And this is how the pieces are joined. So 
kommt die falsche Seite der Klammer genommen. I have no clue. I'm just a layman. Happy? We will see later. Zero <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm still just a layman. Competence isn't a gift to everybody. In this way all the nose pieces of all the ribs are gradually connected to the rear parts of the rib cap strips. In the next step the respective unwrapped rib cap strip is drilled so that the nails can be inserted here. The rib cap strip on the opposite side of the rib, to which the covering will later be sewn, is wrapped with linen strips. That's a rather chilling job that can't be done on the sideline. And this is the point where the Aerodux wood glue does not work with the original Fokker building method. The viscosity of the glue is not sufficient to penetrate through the wrapping of the wooden cap strip to glue the underlaying wood to the fabric. For this reason we use a resin from West Systems. And as we can see, the wrapped component is coated first so that the resin can absorb well into the fabric. Then the plywood web of the rib is also coated and then everything is mounted in the template by nailing. So we nail through the unwound strip and through the plywood web into the wound strip flange underneath. Later in the video, Steffen uses the word glassy. He wants to express the fact that the aerodux becomes so hard that it cracks like glass and it is therefore possible that the fabric also becomes brittle. This does not happen here with the resin by West Systems. And for this reason we will mention later that we are going through the verification process for the usability of the West Systems resin and have it certified for this project. Mit Absprache des Gutachters über die Zerreißproben dann eben äh, genehmigen lassen. Let the cap strips be loose at the end. First deal with the nose section. Make sure all fits and is flush with the cap strip of the underside. Plug in just one nail to fix it all. Then the bottom cap strip followed by the top one. That way it works best for me.
Genau, und dann wird das hübsch. While in the template, in the building jig, the nails are only slightly hammered into. They can be hammered in later on the flat table and then sit tightly and hold the parts firmly together until the resin hardens. The resin by West Systems also does not require high pressure. Gap-free contact of the component is completely sufficient. And so gradually rip by rip is being assembled. Here set the templates and wait. This scene here will also be explained at a later time in the video. The expert would like the so-called compression ribs, i.e. the box ribs or double ribs, to be constructed in such a way that the respective outer layer of the three-layer plywood points in the direction of light. On the Fokker aircraft they were arranged vertically on all ribs. We had also built the first ribs in this way, but because the expert wants to absorb this pressure moment better, we will discuss this again at a later time in the video. Stefan is currently making new ribs here. I will just separate them to start with and then I cut them out. Naturally, everything is properly documented during construction. Paperwork is important, especially in Germany. As you know, we Germans are only happy if we can fill out forms. And then it's on to the next cap, strips of ribs. Drill, wrap the opposite ribs, drill another one and wrap the opposite one, rib by rib. You can do a lot in three days. <laughs> so here we are, the two of us in the workshop. Stefan worked here for the past three days together with me, built all of his wing ribs. There have also been some organizational changes to the project. Stefan can say something about that if he wants to. Uh, pfft, yeah, on the whole we are actually very satisfied with what we have achieved. The wing ribs have all been completed so far. A few are still laying off to dry, we don't have them on the table for the camera. Stefan can now tell you about the interesting things. I'll pass it on to him. Stefan? Yes, hello first of all. Um, we have now spent the last three days finishing the wing ribs for serial number 021. Uh, as I has already said, six of them are still drying. Here you can see the result as it looks now after three days, just under 60 man hours. Then there is an additional eight days of construction time for the building templates. Achim has already prepared for our breakage test, where a rib in its construction, as built by Fokker, is loaded until it breaks. Yes, and we are already curious to see what the design can withstand. As for the construction itself, there were a few points that we had to discuss over Christmas and the winter. On the one hand with the surveyor, but also with the building inspection. The building inspection changed, let's put it that way. And we agreed with the surveyor that we would build the ribs cap strips wrapped. The surveyor had originally thought that the ribs should not be wrapped. However, as we have various options for gluing ribs, we have West Systems, which is a resin. And we have Aerodux, which is actually required by the German CAA. The problem with the story, however, is that we can't use the Aerodux to build a historically correct, accurate replica. Firstly, the Aerodux does not penetrate the winding right down uh, to the belt, and secondly, it becomes as hard as glass. 
That's why uh, after a technical exchange with the expert, we were given the go-ahead to work with red belts, but we had to use a resin for this. We decided to use West System resin, as Arim has had nothing but good experiences with it over the years. Unfortunately, this makes the approval process a little more complicated. Um, in principle, you have you always have to provide evidence for gluing and bonding anyway. We have created glue samples of every rib and every mix. Uh, this is used to check whether the resin or glue has set properly the next day. You can see it here. It's, it's firm. So this is the first check that the glue has set properly and that the rib built with it is usable. What I now have to do specifically for the project is a separate verification procedure that allows us to continue working with the West systems. Because we are away from the Aerodux, such tensile tests have to be created for each project. Thankfully, Achim has produced these already. These pieces are now clamped in the place and have to withstand a tensile load of around 1100 pounds. What needs to be considered? We have a total of 26 pieces, right Achim? 18. There are 18 of them. Six of them with three passes each. There are certain tests that these samples have to undergo. They simply, simply want to know whether the rest system is suitable in principle for this project. And we said, okay, we'll go to the effort because we can simply work cleaner and better as a result. And for those who are interested, as you remember, episode 10 of the workshop show was about the wing construction of the Fokker D7. At that time I addressed the topic. The Aerodux 185 is the only wood glue that is accepted by the German Federal Aviation Office as a clue for woodwork without being asked because it is certified. However, you can use a different adhesive for each project as long as it has proven its suitability for the project in question in tests. And we use these test pieces to prove that the West System resin is suitable for this purpose. They are clamped to the wedges at their ends and pulled. They then have to hold this load under certain conditions. The design of the test pieces corresponds to the specifications in the book Werkstattpraxis für den Bau von Gleit- und Segelflugzeugen by Hans Jacobs and Herbert Lück. And our expert has confirmed these specifications accordingly. If the resin proves its suitability after these test pieces in series of tests, then we can use it for the wrapping of the rib strips. However, he wants the Aerodux for all the other parts. Well, there are reasons for that. You can argue about it or not. Personally, I don't like it at all. Not only is it unsuitable, it's also ugly. I don't want to have that smeared red stuff in my aeroplanes. That's why I don't use it. There are other, more suitable adhesives. But of course, there's nothing wrong with Aerodux itself, and no aeroplane has ever fallen out of the sky because of it. At any rate, these are the test pieces that Stefan has just shown us with which we are providing proof for this project. Unfortunately, this proof is now only accepted for this project. If Steffen wants to build another aeroplane and use the West Systems resin again, he will have to run the proofs again too. The next steps now are that we will load the ribs for breakage and the building inspector will inspect the ribs. We will also carry out the tensile test to certify the resin and as we are currently working on the wing construction, Achim has already prepared the spar cards and shafted them to length. We have to prove the elongation at break and tensile strength of the wood for the wing construction, for example for the spar construction. Test pieces are taken according to the book Werkstattpraxis. 
And then we can actually continue with the wing construction. Important points are that the grain direction is correct and that the wood is naturally dried. But as I said, the building inspector then has the opportunity to say if yes, the material is correct or he would like another sample of the piece. The building inspector can then decide for himself. The origin of the pine is probably from the east. Or where are they from? They come from here. Yep, that's locally grown pine. That was also one of the expert's requirements. He wants to know where the wood comes from. What the fiber course is like. Are there resin pockets in it or similar stories? But we'll do proper documentation so that the building inspector is satisfied. And then I think the Tim construction, construction can begin. It's important that the building inspector has uh, the opportunity to look inside before the spar is sealed. It was a nice and productive three days. Working together with Stefan was fun. And now, Stefan, you can show to the people how small the aeroplane actually is. Here we have some ribs on the table. And there on the other table we put them up to simulate the wing in its original size. It indeed is a very lovely little aeroplane. And when Stefan goes right next to it, you can see how small it is. So I'm now the standard height of a man from 1980. I am 1.7 meters tall. As I said, the aircraft was built in 1919 and the wing has a span of just under 6 meters. So just over 6 meters. 6 meters 10 I think it is. And then later, we don't know exactly yet, it will weigh around 35 kilograms. It's around 70 pounds. We now have a way for the uh, wing ribs for, what did we weigh? Just about 4.5 kilograms all for one wing. It does fit well into the pre-calculated total weight of the wing so that we end up with about 35, 38 kilogram-ish. And that in turn fits nice with the total weight or the expected total weight of the aircraft. Yeah. Hmm. So a few things can be said about the ribs and the wing construction in general. At certain intervals the wing uh, does have so-called compression ribs. Those are box ribs made up out of two ribs glued together to take the compression loads between the spars. The expert of the German CAA requested uh, that we should probably think about putting the outer layer of the rib webs not upright as it was done by Fokker originally but to put them lengthwise to take care of those compression loads a little bit better. So we do this on the wing ribs done for serial number 021 while 020 will be done according to the original uh, way of doing as we know it Fokker did it during the war or just when the war was over. Additionally, he requested an, an wooden stringer that is placed in between the two ribs, so to say that it is sandwiched between the rib webs, which should go lengthwise from front to rear, also to take better, uh, to take the load, the compression loads better. We can do this on serial number 022 as well, it's not a problem. And while the upright stiffeners on the rib webs uh, have been made from lime wood, the expert also requested us to do those from pine, since the elasticity module of it is better. So we can do that also. It's just, these are minor modifications with which we can live. And we will glue them with Aerodrux. Anything else we want the people to know? Nails? Stay in. 
Well, today in aircraft uh, construction, it is common practice to don't put nails in, or if, then put them on wooden strips so that they can be removed afterwards. At the time, they didn't bother about it. They put the nails in and they let them in. We used 5x5 five five millimeter lime caps ribs for the ribs, as on the original. The expert said that this was oversized and could also be made smaller. No, I don't see a reason for that. We get along well with the weight issue, so that's not a topic. What we now have to finalize is the question of whether we can later stitch the covering on directly through to original. Fokker came up with a fabric wrapping in order to follow a request or uh, the new mandatory uh, orders by the inspectorate of the German Army Air Service not to continue nailing on the fabric to the cap strips, which led to, which was one of the reasons that led to the difficulties the Fokker triplane had during service with wing failures and fabric coming apart. So. We have written an article about that. Um, I, I can't refer to it right now here since this is just a synchronized uh, or voice over German edition of the video as a an, as an test piece for the moment. But I will have it in the video description down there. We wrote an article about the entire development of how fabric stitching came into existence with Boko and what the evolution and development of it is. So I refer you to the video description down there to find the article. The expert's idea was now to use modern stitching going through the fabric covering and around the rib with knots on top of it. <clears throat> Fokker used to stitch directly to the wrapping, that's the reason why it was wrapped. And uh, since he probably does not trust the entire design uh, in this case, what we will do eventually is a load test on just the fabric covering. We will show this in one of the next episodes of the workshop watch. For the moment it should be enough here. What else he said, uh, probably in far too much detail now. On the O20 you nailed on the pressure bars and the expert said, yeah, you don't really need that. The purpose of the nails is just to keep the pieces in relation to each other unless the screw, the, the, unless the glue sets so that they don't move while the glue is hardening. We discussed the topic of saving weight, uh, but the entire, it's just a few hundred grams, that is it's not very important. You can leave them in. Saving weight by removing nails is possible, maybe worth the effort, but in the end we just eat a little bit less before we fly. Serves so the same purpose. We are too fat anyway. Wing spars are, are, or the flanges are prepared so far, all the scarf joints are made, they are scarfed to the correct length already. Now with the warm days coming in springtime we will laminate them to the wing spar beams. Hopefully in the course of the springtime we will be able to put the wing together so far that we can put it on top of the fuselage. At the next inspection date. Yes. With a brand new inspector. The fuselage, as it stands with the tail unit and undercarriage, can then be weighed so that you can start to roughly determine the center of gravity. Oh, yeah. What could be told is that undercarriage, fuselage, appanage is already accepted by the inspector and the paperwork is all done, so this is in safe or in, uh, as we say in Germany, trockenen Tüchern, so in, in, in dry racks now. And the new inspector will take over soon. He got the documentation already, 
everything is clear with the new inspector. He says he wants to take over. He's interested. That's it. Well, that's the most important things covered so far. Um, what else we can say is, yeah, well, the the flanges for the next bars are prepared. With the next workshop watch, I hope you will be able to see how the wind spars are built. This will be episode 19. Um, as a matter of fact, by the time I'm recording this, I already know that episode 19 is out and this is one day before episode 19 will air. So <laughs> this is why I put together the English translation for episode 18 today, Friday. So tonight I can show the episode 18 on YouTube and, and tomorrow premiere will be of episode 19. So mm, that's it for today. Not much more to add here. And so one hour is already full and one other workshop is done, uh, workshop watch is done. So, but uh, the remaining minutes we will get full anyway. So some of you may know Paolo Severin. Paolo Severin is one of the most gifted large scale model builders in Europe. He owned a company that produced uh, kits. And for now he's retired and is doing his work only. And he asked me whether he could have the drawings of the Engels E7. I said, oh sure, why not? And so he started to actually build a one third scale model of the Engels E7 or the Poker V40, however you take it. And this is of course of interest to us anyway, since in one third scale it is not too far off of the original one. Uh, and so we have a little model experimental example of the Engels E7. So if this little one will fly, we will have no problems. Not that there are any problems, uh, that the big one will also fly. So we are looking very much forward. And uh, Paolo is not just talk, he's actually doing things. And his little plane looks very good. Here are a few photographs. Dient es ja als eventuelle Fallstudie für eine spätere Lackierung. Von der V40 selbst gab es ja nur einen Prototyp und dieser Prototyp, der war mit dem bedruckten Tarnstoff aus dem Ersten Weltkrieg bespannt, weil zu der Zeit in Schwerin noch genug davon da war und man hat es halt verwendet. Aber We will use his model also as a studying object for the livery the little one will get. As you know, there only existed one V40 at the time in 1919 and they covered it with what they had. And this was the uh, printed aircraft fabric, the camouflaged stuff. So, uh, if the airplane would have been manufactured for a civil market, it would have got a civil livery, of course. And we will do one based on the early KLM uh, livery that Fogart did for the F2 when he produced it for the KLM. And, and this will be probably what it will look like. And we will see it in Paolo's little model. And check out the internet for air photographs or air to air movies or other clips done by those people who actually uh, operate aircraft that I have built. It's an absolute marvelous sight and they do great work on it. Uh, there we have TVAL in New Zealand, of course, and uh, the Omaka Aviation Heritage Center, which took over three of my airplanes, which have previously been on lawn. Uh, to the Australian Vintage Aviator or Aviation Society under Andrew Carter, which unfortunately closed a few months ago, which is a real pity. He did great work maintaining my aircraft and uh, flying them. And we have found a new home with them under Graham Orphan and Tony Weitenberg is actually taking care of the engines. My own E3 is by the way operated uh, using one or the first rotary engine that Tony actually built. He, I have never met him in person but surely hope I will. He seems to be a great guy and of course is doing absolute marvelous work. So uh, check those aeroplanes out and I have published another book. I'd like to announce the release of my new book on the Fokker uh, stencils and their e development. Uh, you should follow up my Facebook page or my internet page and have a look or down in the description I give the link to where you can download this book. It's a free download as all of my books, they are free. 
but of course donations are welcome since we have to keep our museum going. So don't be hesitant to download the book in case you're interested in it. And if you have the ability to donate something via PayPal, just do so. Much appreciated. Enjoy. Have a good night or day or wherever you are. Und das war sie auch schon wieder, die Werkstattschau des Museums für Flugzeugbau und Technische Geschichte in Weschenbeuren. Besuchen Sie uns doch mal. Jeden ersten Samstag im Monat von 9 bis 18 Uhr geöffnet. Museum für Flugzeugbau und Technische Geschichte in Weschenbeuren. Wir freuen uns auf Ihren Besuch.